get, get that going. There we go. Right. Morning, everybody. Lovely to see you guys here. Um, I'm sure we'll have a few more coming in and out over the next few minutes, but we'll make a start anyway. I'm hoping you can all see my screen uh, and that you're all feeling kind of uh, positive after your first session this morning. Loads of great content in the Emma Pass um, presentation first thing. And actually, I'll be picking up quite a lot of what she said in this session now about assessment. So, um, first of all, massive thanks to the Lebanon volunteer community who have invited myself and my colleagues this morning to come and, and spend some time with you uh, and learn together. Uh, it's really uh, lovely to be invited and lovely to be part of such an event uh, as this, which is such a positive and uplifting experience to be in. Uh, should introduce myself. My name's Laura. I'm a secondary school teacher. I've been teaching secondary school in the UK. That's 11 to 18 year olds for about 15 years now. Um, but I'm also um, doing a doctorate, doing a PhD in how children learn, how we can teach teachers. So I come at this from a kind of academic and uh, practical perspective. Um, if you have questions uh, during the session, feel free to drop them in the chat and I'll come and check every now and then that I've not missed any. Um, or if you feel happier and you want to go onto Twitter, you can connect with me on Twitter. I'm always happy to um, answer questions uh, through Twitter or you can kind of ask me things later if they come up or you have puzzles. Uh, if you're not on Twitter, I'd very much recommend it for education. There's a big community of people who are all happy to uh, you know, share and collaborate and help each other and learn. So do, uh, do connect on Twitter. My Twitter handle is there. I'm at Think Teach Tech. Uh, welcome those who have just joined us. There's been a bit of a mix up on links, so don't worry, you haven't missed much yet. I've just introduced myself. Uh, my name's Laura. Uh, it's lovely to have you here today and lovely to be with you. Right, let's make a formal start. So we're going to, we've got an hour, which is lovely, which means we've got plenty of time. So during the session today, I'm really hoping to actually give you a few minutes for you to do a little bit of building and playing and hands-on time so that your learning is concretized rather than just an abstract set of ideas. Um, I'm going to talk about why you could and should do assessment this way. I'm going to show you specifically quite a lot of detail on Google Forms, but almost everything I show you on Google Forms can equally be done on Microsoft Forms. I just thought it was simpler to choose one platform and show you that for the potential, but it's all translatable. In the third section, I'm going to show you a whole selection of different tools. In a moment, I'm going to ask you which tools you already use, and then I'm going to try and pick some that perhaps you don't so many of you know. I'm going to try and finish up with lots of time for Q&A. That's the plan. So the first thing to think about is why would you do online assessment? Well, obviously, practically, we kind of have to if we're not in the classroom. But I think there are other reasons for doing assessment this way, too, which are um, really powerful and really uh, beneficial to teachers and to students. So I think the first um, significant reason to assess this way, the two big, big things we all want to think about is well-being. Uh, when we spoke to uh, the teachers in Lebanon before today with the volunteer community, one of the biggest concerns of the teachers were around assessment. Um, a sense that assessment was very, very pressured for students and for families, and that students felt that like there was always a lot of pressure and expectation on grades. And because of that, um, sometimes some students are kind of feeling pushed to... Um, Get help with tests and it's hard to know kind of who's completing the testing or whether they're being tested accurately so all of that well-being conversation can we can help with that by changing the way we assess obviously we still have to do significant national testing of course but as we approach those we can do lots and lots and lots of low stakes tests taste tests that don't really matter what the outcome is um, and our students can learn and develop confidence um, in those settings, which hopefully just starts to shift that mindset around testing. Um, I have worked for the last 10 years in a very academic, selective um, school where the students put themselves under huge pressure to succeed and their pressure and anxiety around exams is very high. Introducing this over the last three or four years has started to change their views around assessment. So I'd recommend it. Um, in terms of workload, this really, really helps me as a teacher because I can create an assessment and I can use it over and over and over and over again. And I can tweak it and adjust it. But broadly speaking, the time it takes me to make one 
is about the same time it used to take me to mark one class set of tests, probably less to be honest, and they're self-grading. Um, all the videos will be on the site um, afterwards, I, I believe. Uh, but if it's not, I'll just get in touch with the volunteer community and they can be forwarded out to you, no problem. So uh, student wellbeing, teacher wellbeing, student workload in terms of accessing it easily, but teacher workload in terms of all of the things I'm going to show you today are automatically self-grading. Um, and that is just a massive weight off your mind and a weight off your shoulders. I've used these for end of year assessments when you know 100, 200 students doing the assessment at the same time. And all of that grading I just don't have to do. It's time that I can reinvest in my teaching. The other reason for doing online assessment is the opportunity to practice. Students can practice and repeat the tests after the tests really, really easily and revise. And we all know that that practice is, is so important for their learning. I get all the data, so I get spreadsheets. Out of everything I show you today has a, an option to give you back a spreadsheet of grades. Uh, again, it's that what, um, efficiency and work reduction is what we're all about. So the first thing I want you to do for me today is just fill in a quick form. I'm going to put that in the chat for you. It's bit.ly, so all you need to do is type this into any browser. And um, tell me where you're up to with this kind of thing, because I don't want to uh, spend time telling you stuff you already know. So I'm going to stop sharing my screen for a second. Open that form up while you're filling it in. Only got a few questions. Give it a minute or two to see some responses popping in. If you're not familiar with Bitly, um, Bitly is a, a simple website where you can put in any web address and uh, create a short link like this. So by changing it to um, Lab Forms, uh, it's easy for me to say in a classroom setting or to put on a board in a classroom setting um, without having to have that really long link that you get from Microsoft Forms or Google Forms. So we've got some responses coming in and you can see here on my screen, I'm sharing the, the responses side. This is the responses coming into me in real time. So we've got a whole selection coming in. Here we go. So we've got uh, 13 in a session. So we've got few responses here now. Just refreshing my page just to make sure I've got all the responses. So this is the kind of activity you can easily do at the start of a lesson that's um, a hybrid lesson where you've got some students in front of you and some students perhaps working over Teams or Skype or Zoom. Um, you can post that link in both places and then it brings the class together as everybody participates wherever they are and you get that snapshot of where your class is today. Um, the duck scale is just a really simple activity that helps uh, to understand where people are, where the well-being is. So that's another way to use uh, these things rather than for assessment, but for kind of surveying and polling. Um, here we go. Is it difficult to test progress with the students? So most of us are saying, yeah, it's really quite difficult to test progress, particularly under COVID, particularly after kind of trauma. It's difficult to be sure of where people are. And most of you are saying that you think your students are between kind of moderately anxious and extremely anxious about tests. And mo the sort of average is that we've done a bit of exploring of this, but not too much. Uh, what have we seen and liked already? Kahoot is popular everywhere. Well done. I'm glad it's popular in Lebanon too. 
Uh, but there's a few there that we haven't seen so much, which is really nice. Um, and, and one worry there is about using new platforms for students. I think it's a good worry to have. My advice typically is to um, use fewer tools better. So if you consistently use two or three things, then the student's mental effort goes on the content, not on finding their way through a new platform. So today I'll probably show you a couple of them, maybe maybe three, depending on how, how much time we have. But I would advocate for becoming the real master of one or two of them and understanding how to use them for exactly what you want them to do and doing it well, rather than flitting around between too many different things too much of the time. Thank you for participating, everybody. So hopefully that's just a demonstration of how quickly and easily you can get some, some responses in from your class. So I set my poll, my poll up here, very, very straightforward, and I get this summary of responses here. Um, I deliberately selected anonymous for this poll, but you could have collecting addresses so you knew who was giving which answers. So I've got the summary here, and maybe in another setting I want more information. And in that case, I can make a spreadsheet from my responses and forms here. This is useful typically if you've actually got student names, student data, and then it's it's easier for kind of just getting that, that summary overview and you can use this jumps you out into Google Sheets, which is kind of like Excel. Um, but if you use Microsoft Forms, this comes out in an Excel format. Uh, any of the other tools that I use, you choose your download format between Excel and Sheets. Mostly it's Excel. Um, while we're here in Google Sheets, I like the if you don't know about it, I'll show you the explore function. I tap this button here, it'll it'll look at the data and show me some charts. It'll make some suggestions about how I might want to visualize that data. So I can easily do things like pivot tables or average analyses and so forth. And do all of that very quickly and very easily and very efficiently. Okay, thank you for playing. That gives me a, a good idea of kind of whereabouts in my um, session we need to spend time. Um, and hopefully it just gives you a little bit of a model of, of one of the ways we can do things. So I'm going to talk a bit about Google Forms, but again, as I said at the start, almost everything you would do in Google Forms, you can do in Microsoft Forms. But in terms of being the master of one tool, I think Google Forms is so flexible that it's really worth getting to grips with. You don't have to be using all of the Google tools to you. You can just use one of them. Uh, and this is probably one of the ones that people um, really like and really value. These are just some examples of, of ways that I've used Google Forms with my students over the last six, seven years, probably in different ways. The daily survey, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to demonstrate making that in a second with you. We did all through remote learning. So we started doing it in March. We did it every single day. Every student had to fill in the survey every single day. And what that did was gave us a, a snapshot of our population in terms of, how, of their well being, their workload, uh, and any other questions or problems that they had they wanted to talk to their teachers about. And by doing it every single day, it gave us data over time about our whole student body. So that's something you can do at a school level or just at an individual level within your classroom. You can do it every lesson. Um, you can do it just to gather information, like I just did with you at the start of the session. How much do you know? What are your worries? Where do you? What do you need? Um, you can also do it for organisation. So, I mean, school trips seems like a really long time ago, doesn't it, since we <laughs> did trips? But um, you know, potentially you could look at. Um, I used to look after students in residential settings in a, in a boarding school. Like, how how do they want to share rooms? You know, once upon a time. Um, they had to come and, and give me a piece of paper. And we knew that all the social and emotional stuff that was going on around who they wanted to share rooms with was, was a real pressure. So by actually giving them the opportunity to just quietly do this in an online form, it took away quite a lot of the um, social pressure that was going on around who would say what they wanted with whom. Obviously, very easy for voting. Um, evaluation. This would be an end of year exam I did with the whole other school year group. Um, 
just a nurse, a bit knowledge of a, of a whole school year. Um, so we did, they had a 60 minute, uh, 30 minute multiple choice questions and then a written paper to go alongside. So the two components together, we cut in half the teacher workload for marking end of year school exams. They still had a written paper, but the, by the testing multiple choice questions, they had to really have learned the content and to know it. That worked well. Quick quizzes, yeah, uh, regular topic assessments, lots, lots of different ways to do it. So what I'm gonna start off with is just showing you really simply how to build a daily survey. Because I think it's something that's really useful and easy to apply. Uh, if you are a Microsoft person, you'd go to office.com and pick up forms.microsoft.com. Uh, if you're working in Google, forms.google.com or forms.new, the .new extension uh, in anything Google takes you to a new one in your drive. So here's my new form. I'm going to title it Daily Check-in here. And that will follow the into there. And I'm adding questions. I've got different types of questions that I can ask. If I'm wanting a like snapshot type question, I quite like using scales because they're really quick and you can make it quite um, subtle by say going naught to 10. I don't know, um, how are you feeling today? <clears throat> I guess I'm picking my question type over here, but I've got all these other question types that I could use. If I just want it to be a quick one, Now, for each question I add, I have the option of making a required question or a not required question. Personally, I'll make this a required question because this is actually what I really want to know about. And they won't be able to submit the form if they haven't put something in here for me. Now, I want another question, but I want it to be quite similar to this one. I can just click this duplicate button here. And I can say, how are you managing your studies today. Again, I can use the same scales or I can say, you know, I'm really struggling. I'm being on top of things. And that might be enough. But you might want to, and I, I like to give an extra box. So if I had another question, and this time it's just going to give them a blank space. Is there anything else you want to tell me about? With younger students, I would give some examples like, I don't know, I missed my breakfast today, my granny's poorly. Um, it's a, a holiday in my religion today. Giving them some prompts, some cues, helps them to think about the kinds of things you might want to know about. But with your older students, you might not need to, or you might just need to discuss your expectations. This question I'm going to make not required because they don't have to tell me anything. Um, if, there's no, if there's no problem or if they just don't want to tell me about the problem, that's also fine. So making that form took me a minute and a half, something like that. Um, and it's now ready to go. I can do different things. I can customize it. I can change the background and add pictures and change the color and whatever I want to do. But broadly speaking, that's ready to go. If I click on send here, um, I'm not collecting email addresses because oh, on this one, I am collecting email addresses. So I click this button here that will collect their email addresses. I click this link here. Can copy that link and pop it into my Microsoft Teams chat, my Google Classroom page. I could just email it to my students. Um, and that gives me that snapshot feel of where they're at um, on, on any given day. And by doing that daily, I can start to see trends over time. I can do things like on my spreadsheet that comes out the other end, I can add conditional formatting. So I can make it easy for myself Let's imagine that on this how are you feeling column, we know that like zeros 
is low, don't we? We've said that zero is low. And on the how are you managing column, still loading. See the little working button there. So on those two columns, I can add some conditional formatting on my data that um, makes it go red if it's less than three. So all I need to do is keep an eye on that spreadsheet after I've sent it out and anything really striking will jump out at me. So because I know that when we're assessing online, we're not actually always just looking for numbers. We are often looking for um, information about how they're doing, opportunities to connect and be with them. Um, thank you, Haifa. It's a great question. End of term tests for upper elementary. Worries about connection, variety of questions and critical thinking questions. Absolutely. So we'll get a bit more into the nitty gritty of those kinds of things in a second or two. Um, when we are doing um, assessments um, and thinking about multiple choice questions. So we did end of year assessments for, I'm assuming that upper elementary is like 13, 14, 15 year olds. Uh, we use multiple choice, but we made the multiple choice questions pretty stretching. So it would be things like, which of these is the best definition of this word? Um, uh, which of these is not an appropriate response? So we're forcing them to read the question carefully. We're forcing them to consider the answers, making the multiple choice questions, um, the definitions quite close together. There's a lot of really good research about how to write good multiple choice questions. So it's not really Googleable, like which is the best definition? Oh, sorry, eight and 11, fine. Um, so, but the same sort of thing applies really. So if you look at um, constructing good multiple choice questions, there, there is great research out there as to how to make that really stretching. You can also in forms blend together multiple choice questions, which are automatically grading and manually graded sections. Personally, I always prefer to separate them out have the multiple choice questions, multiple choice, and then get the students to hand in a piece of written work or a photograph of written work, which I would mark by hand. Uh, but it's got to be about what works for your context, really. So in forms, there are some things to think about. Um, anonymity or not, whether questions are required or not, when to release the scores um, and, and limiting responses. If I'm looking for a snapshot, or like I did at the start of the session today, I don't need to know who you are. And the fact that I don't need to know, don't know who you are gives you the freedom to respond honestly and openly without worrying about being judged or, or singled out. I think our students feel that pressure too. So if you're just after a snapshot, you don't have to collect, collect email addresses. Come back to forms. Oh, too many screens. So here, in my settings, I can choose whether or not I'm collecting email addresses. If I'm working with students and I'm assessing, then obviously I need to collect email addresses. This is the one thing you can't change later if you miss it out. So it's definitely worth making sure that box is ticked. Because um, although it's very clever, it cannot um, doesn't know who's filled it in if you haven't collected the addresses. If I'm doing an assessment and I'm worried about students kind of trying multiple times, I would definitely limit it to one response. And that stops them from kind of going away, looking everything up and then coming back and putting it in again. They need to do it in real time. I also wouldn't select um, edit after submission or seeing summary charts or responses. So what I would typically do would is do an end of year assessment with my whole year group with, with limit to one response and sign in. Then I would um, do all the grading, release all the grading. And then I would change this, I would take this off and I would require students to repeat the assessment and to improve their grade. So by limiting it to one before the release of grading and then changing that afterwards, it makes it easier. Um, I didn't used to worry too much about this part, um, but if you've got a very long, but again, I wouldn't have a massively long form. Now quizzes, I want to make this a quiz, easy enough, toggle it over. This is the important part. If you're doing a more formal assessment like Haifa is saying, you would definitely have later after manual review. Because that means as a teacher, you are in control of all of those grades and you decide when the grades are released. 
If it's just an informal test, you might want to say release it immediately, but generally I'd release it later. And when it's released, I want to have all this information available to my students so they can then do it again and improve their scores. If I wanted to make this a quiz, I need right answers. So let's say that um, here, that this is a correct answer situation. I can edit this question in the, and I click here to click this answer key. I say what the right answer is. It's worth one point. Right answer is and so forth. And I can add answer feedback. So I can add a video there explaining what the answer is, a little screencast or um, a link to a YouTube video um, here. Or I can add a link perhaps to a lesson resource, something where this is, you know, this is the, the presentation I did that taught you this part, go look at it again. And they can repeat that over and over again. So you can add, you can add all this feedback for correct answers or for incorrect answers depending on whether you think you'll be with your students when the when you're releasing scores or not releasing scores. Um, and you can do that for each question. And what that will tell you is how many points that um, uh, assessment is worth. So there's a lot of nuance in just one tool set. Again, thinking back to um, the previous question about worrying about using too many different tool sets. Um, just using Google Forms, you can do everything you want to do and retain quite a lot of control over how that's working. Okay. So, I wanted to give you a few minutes to build a form. But I wonder whether actually we might change tack and look at some of the other options first and then give you time to play just before Q&A, because then your questions will be informed. So let's do that. Let's move this down. Yeah, this challenge. Oops. Okay. So Forms is my favorite. It's really versatile. You can really master it and do lots of different things with it. But sometimes you want some variety. Um, I like to think about online assessment tools as being like a spice rack. Um, everybody loves garlic, but you don't want garlic every night. Uh, so these different tools is just a handful of favourites. There's, there's, there are masses of them. Um, they provide different flavours. They're all essentially multi largely multiple choice content based tools where students can practice learning and where I can assess their practice and, and see how their understanding is developing. But they feel different. Some of them are more lively, some of them are quieter, some of them are more, um, some of them are video based, some of them are slides based. So by having a few of these, it's possible to decide, you know, for example, if I teach my really um, excitable 11 year olds, um, I don't know, lunchtime on a Friday, I'm probably going to want to use something that's actually quite quiet, that encourages them to think and take their time because they'll be quite giddy and excitable anyway because that's just how they like whereas perhaps my 15 year olds who might on a Monday morning who might be quite oh, I'm sleepy I'm tired I might want to use something that's more like invigorating so having these things at your fingertips in terms of knowing which tool for the which class at which time is really really useful um I'm going to, based on your forms feedback, I think I might start off by um, showing you uh, Edpuzzle because that wasn't um, an option that was widely known. Um, or maybe, actually, I'm going to start off with Quizlet because uh, there is method in my madness. Can you give me a vote, one to 10 in the chat? One is never seen it, 10 is use it every day. Uh, one to ten for Quizlet. Have you seen Quizlet before? Excellent. That's helpful. Thank you very much. So a couple who've not seen it before. Quizlet is designed, thanks Nadji, for vocabulary learning. And it has got some built-in um, tools. The reason for starting with Quizlet is there's a lot of content that's already there. Doesn't mean it's perfect, 
but it can be a time saver in terms of giving you a starting point for um for what you want to do so i just need to open up a different set of tabs that i have ready what are they hiding uh, not that one typically it's going to be behind the one that i want isn't it there they are okay can i just check in can i get a y in the chat if you can see the quizlet slides now or an n if you can't Excellent, thank you very much. Okay, so Quizlet, like everything else EdTech, there is a free version and there's a paid version. And the free version is more than adequate for everything I want to do. Um, but if you really love it and you get really excited about it and you find you want to use it more, you might in time want to upgrade. But um, I use it at the free level and it's been fine for me so far. So let's say I'm about to start teaching something. Um, maybe Haifa, tell me about the subject you might um, be assessing in upper elementary. Um, I'm just going to see whether there's something here already that we could use as the basis for a further assessment. So what topic might you be thinking about in upper elementary? Or if anybody else wants to give me a topic, we can look for and see. Weather, exciting. Okay, let's try that. So I'm just searching um, any content that they have on weather. And I can refine my search a little bit by sort of age range uh, and who's them. Um, let's go. Oh, let's go. So I only want to look at free content. I only want to look at study sets. Okay, so I've got some content here and you can, as you can see, some of this is, I'm assuming this is Russian, there's content in other subjects. Let's imagine for the sake of argument that this is kind of appropriate for our needs. And what you can see here is a set of flashcards based on, based on content. Okay look at the whole set make sure that it's right for me um, and if this set is useful i can take a copy of it so click on these three dots here i can um actually i think the first thing i would do is duplicate it sorry by duplicating it it makes a set in my account that's separate to this set. And the first thing it does for me is open up the whole set, all of the uh, questions and answers in a row here for me. And I can check, this is probably the easiest place to check them as well, make sure that I'm happy with them. Um, let's say those are fine. I don't need to tap on this create button in the right hand side. Um, sometimes uh, teachers ask me about this big pointer if I'm teaching online and I'm using Google Chrome, I would really recommend using a big pointer. Uh, it just makes it easier for students to follow uh, what they're doing. And you can install a pointer from the Chrome web store. Um, there are lots of them available. So I've got this set. And the first thing it's going to ask me is, do I want to share it? So if I'm using Teams, I can add Quizlet as, a, as an app within Teams and install these as a learning set. Or I can share them to Google Classroom as, a, as an assignment. I don't want to share them just yet because I want to make sure I'm happy with them. So I can give these to my students and they can play play various learning games with them. And we've said before about that well-being aspect of practice. Uh, and they can play these games in Quizlet with this set of cards. So if I was going to test students on their knowledge of this vocabulary, the preceding week I would give them these as, an, as a learning activity to come into Quizlet and do some learning games. I don't get feedback on whether they've done it or not, but if they know I'm going to test them the following week on these definitions, it's quite likely that they would come in and do this kind of a set kind of task. So by starting here, I get a couple of other advantages. So I can export this set of, of stuff. And I've got this comes up here. 
Now, let's say I want to work with a different platform. So um, Quizalize is another platform that I really like. Um, again, it's free. There's a free level and a paid level. Um, if I come into Quizalize and I want to create a new quiz, I can actually bring that content across from Quizlet. So if I click Report from Quizlet, I go back to from that export here and copy all that text, paste it in there. Now what's really, really clever, it will automatically make incorrect answers for me from the definition deck. So let's save that. And I can just quickly preview it. So I've gone from flashcards for practice to a quiz that I can assign to my students and I can get feedback from. So let's have a quick look. Where's my student preview gone? Here. This is what it looks like to students in Quizalize. And I've got, you can see I've got a countdown timer there and I have to check, check the correct answer. I'm going to guess that it's what is weather, not an expert geographer. And there's, um, you can turn this off or on, but like most of these sites, the faster answer gets a higher score. And that element of the faster answer getting a higher score can be a useful way of dealing with students going away and looking up the answer for each question. But over time, as you do this kind of activity, they start to enjoy the learning itself. Um, my students would regularly ask me, can we play quizzes? Can we play Quizalize? Can we play Quizlet? Can we play Jinkit? Can we play Kahoot? Because they're, they're playing and they, they can access their competitive side and have fun and they sort of forget that it's like an assessment. I'm running out of time here. I have absolutely no idea. I'm going to just guess something. Oh, great, correct. So, because I started in, uh, let's come out of this now, um, quizzes, Quizlet, sorry, they're all called the same sort of name. Um, I was able to take that out of there and put it into here, which is helpful. So, that is just simply about definitions and answers. So it's not higher level thinking, but you can change those multiple choice questions around to make them quite difficult. Um, what I like about, let's go back to Quizlet. So I didn't have to make it, but I can make it, I can import it. If I've got my own content in a spreadsheet, I can upload a spreadsheet and it will generate it from the spreadsheet for me really, really easily. Um, I haven't got a spreadsheet to hand, but you get the idea, I think. So if I've got those basic content and the students can rehearse that basic content, I found teaching philosophy and ethics that familiarity with the vocabulary, even for English speaking students in an English speaking setting, that improved their writing. Um, so I used Quizlet for that. There are also live learning games you can play with Quizlet, which are really fun and they're team orientated. And again, that's a really nice way of dealing with the hybrid scenario. Uh, you can play uh, Quizlet Live, uh, which puts them into Teams, and they can play over Teams or Zoom or Skype with students in the classroom in real time. Yeah, exactly, Haifa. So as we said at the beginning, selecting the tool that's right for the job. So personally, I always use Google, Google Forms as a kind of for anything that was a bit more formal, but for kind of classroom activities, they quite enjoyed having different flavors at different times. I built up my portfolio of platforms with my students very gradually over a period of time. So I was a digital learning director. So what we would do is probably every, every term, I would train the staff body on one tool. And what the effect of that is more teachers would try that tool at about the same time. So the students' confidence would increase with it. But most of these students are quite happy with, they're not too, they're, the complexity is quite low, even for younger students. And so they aren't too phased by 
jumping between platforms. But if your teachers aren't confident, then your teachers make mistakes in setting it up and that kind of stuff. And so that gets frustrating for students if things go wrong. So better to really, really master one or two things yourself, build up your practice with those things, and then gradually add new flavours over time. That would definitely be my, my answer. So Quizlet Fab for finding content, you're very welcome, um, from which you can take it into other platforms for other things. Um, Quizlet, as I like, and I think almost none of you had, had seen it or heard of it, um, if you're using Google Classroom, you can actually connect your Quizalyze account to your Google Classroom account. And the effect of that is in the Google Classroom gradebook, the, the answers from Quizalyze come into the gradebook. So once you've created the, um, the quiz and assigned it from here, hang on. Um, uh, this one assigned it. You can connect it to your Google Classroom. I probably can't because I haven't got a Google Classroom account on this. Oh, yeah. Share to Google Classroom and export the results to Google Classroom. So, as a busy teacher, I don't have to come back to Quizalyze to look for the results and see what the answers are. They appear in my Google Classroom gradebook. Um, I don't think it's got the connection to Teams yet, but I'm sure it's coming because. Most of these platforms understand that it's in their interest to make life easy for teachers. Um, but certainly using this in classroom was effective. This also has the exam function, so you can assign it with a, with kind of less of the gamification uh, and more of the kind of quiet assessment. So you've got different ways of playing in here. So that's a really, really brief introduction to Quizlet and to Quizalyze. Um, I do want to show you Edpuzzle because it's different. Um, can I have a, a 1 to 10 on our experience of Edpuzzle? 1 is never seen it, 10 is using it every day. Yep, fabulous. Thanks, Naji. Any other votes on Edpuzzle? Okay. So just the same as all these platforms, they're all multiple choice. That doesn't mean they're not rigorous. That doesn't mean it's not challenging. That doesn't mean it's not, um, uh, that doesn't mean it's easy for students to do them. Um, I use Edpuzzle when I want students to think a bit more carefully about something. So it might be like historically, I would just give them a video. Like you, so you could potentially make your own screencast, upload that into Edpuzzle and then add questions. Or you could use any video based content. So you can take things from Khan Academy, from YouTube, from National Geographic, all kinds of other places and add questions into it. Just got some examples here uh, of how I've used this in the past. You can see I've used it here for student training. So if I'm worried about whether or not my students understand how to use a tool, I can make them a screencast and add questions into the screencast so that they have to answer the questions. And that shows me that they've understood. Um, let's have a look at something where I think there might be some um, grading. Let's have a look at this one. So teaching, reasoning and critical thinking. This is a nice little um, riddle which hopefully illustrates what reasoning is about. I can just import that video from YouTube. And then as I'm, once I've got it into this editor function, you can see I can add different content to that video. So for example, here, I've just added a note. It's not a question, it's something- I'm Taking that. I want students to know maybe why I've assigned this or what I'm asking them for. So listen, and think and try to find your own solutions. Okay, and then we go through. And then the next um, element that I've added is another note. And then here, Actually, these are all notes. <laughs> okay, let's add a question just to demonstrate. So I find the point in the video where I want to add a question. So I pause the video there, and then I can add questions. I can choose. So I can add a multiple choice question, um, which 
of these answers do you think best describes the process of reasoning? <laughs> Correct. You can give a range of answers. You can have as many as you like. You can add different images and things there. You can have different, you can attach different documents. You can do all kinds of different things there. And obviously you just indicate that that is the correct answer and save it. And that question will automatically grade. So if I go to another one, which is, um, and then I can assign it. And again, the same as um, Quizalize, let's finish that video so it saves, so it saves all the stuff. I can then assign it from here. And in this case, again, it's linking to Google Classroom. Um, I haven't got classes in this um, setting, but I could link it up to my Google Classroom account and assign it. And similarly, it will um, push the results back into Classroom for me. So once it's been done, I don't have to um, come back here to look and see who's done it, who's not done it, how well they've done. I'll go to Gradebook. I might have some examples here that I can share. No, okay, that's fine. Um, you see each question. You see how, how long it took them to answer the question. You see that whether it took them multiple attempts to get the correct answer because it gives them the feedback. Um, and the students can't advance through the video without answering the question. So when the student is working with this content, let's go back to my content. Let's preview that. This is what it looks like to the students on whatever device they're on. It plays. And then it stops. And they have an option. So if it's a question and they don't understand, they can re-watch and it just re-watches the previous 15 or so seconds and prompts them up. Thanks, Haifa. Have a lovely weekend yourself. Uh, and then they can carry on. So that is three tools which from your initial survey you weren't so familiar with. So Quizlet, which is a great source because there's tons of content already there. From Quizlet, you can take that content out. So Quizalize. Quizalize also has a lot of ready-made content. So again, you can search in the resources and it's easy in Quizalize to make content and share it with your colleagues. Uh, but let's say I wanted to look at, was it child labor? Jihan said child labor. I can search and see if there is content on child labor and I can see the level, I can look for particular national curriculums, excuse me, or particular grades. And again, once I've got that content, I can make a copy for it for myself to use it with my students. Oh, that's right, let's play that quiz. I can make a copy. Oh, it's already made a copy for me. I'm already in my in my context. There we go. And I can assign it to my students directly from there. So a lot of these sites have contents already there that's um, decent quality. You can edit that content. You can make it specific for yourself. Um, and then assign it directly to your classes and have those grades coming back into your classroom pages if you're using Google Classroom. So Quizalize is great fun. Um, quizzes are similar, but I won't go there because that's too many new tools. Um, and Edpuzzle, I would recommend for anything that's video content based. Okay. When we are assigning videos, we've talked a bit about cognitive load um, in terms of not having too many new tools. Um, but these are things that you should, these are questions you should ask when you meet a new tool and decide whether or not you're going to bring it into your um, classroom. First of all, how easy is it to import questions? So can you bring in a spreadsheet, which most of these you can, or can you find content that's already there and adapt it? And again, most of these you can. How will this work practically if you're hybrid? So is this a, a way you can play live with your students who are in class while students who are not in class can play remotely. Most of these, that's great because it's joining by a link or joining by a code. It's not so great for students who are asynchronous. 
So if you've got the ability, most of these you can't play asynchronously. But what you can do is share the link after the game. Uh, and the student who wasn't able to play in real time and students who maybe didn't do so well can replay later. So there's an independent play mode. Um, practice mode, same thing. So after the, after the game, uh, you can give the students the link and they can replay and try and improve their scores. So I used to grade for my students for improvement. So we play it in class and then homework and I'd note down their scores, I'd have their scores. Um, and then homework task would be to play it again and improve their score. Um, and so what I'm grading them on is their progress rather than on their initial, their first attempt. And anything like this we can do to depressurize testing and change that mindset is hopefully helpful. Data and tracking. Um, everything I've showed you today will give you a spreadsheet of the results. So you can add that to your grade books and cut, build up that information about how your students are doing over time. Okay, I've talked for too long. Um, so we've got about eight minutes left. Would you like time to play or would you like to move to Q&A? So let's go for a P for play or a Q for questions. Into the chat for me. Playtime. Any other votes? P for play or Q for questions? Playtime, excellent, okay. So um, I suggest you, do, thank you. I'll give it a whirl, Nadji. Um, I'm giving you six minutes playtime. Um, so I think that's probably long enough to go to one of the tools that I've talked about and set up an account. So um, let's do that and we'll reconvene uh, with just a tiny bit of time for questions. I don't mind if the questions over run into break. So let's do that. Okay, I'll stick around here, uh, but I'll turn the recording off um, and you can go and have a quick play. Hopefully you can see the countdown timer. <laughs> 